Welcome to Chabad Inspiration. The holiday of Sukkot, the Yom Tov of Sukkot, in so many ways is of the most joyous holidays that we have. In fact, according to Jewish tradition, when we make Kiddush the first night of Yom Tov, the night of Sukkot, we welcome the Yom Tov with the words Zaman Simchasenu, the holiday and the time of our happiness, of our rejoicing. So Sukkot carries with it the key and the secret to Jewish happiness. The question becomes, what is the secret? The following is primarily based on the teachings of Hasidus, as it is taught in the Rebbe's teachings, and I hope and pray that I serve as a good vessel to transmit at least some of these ideas accurately. B'chaim, we should go from Simcha to Simcha, and the happiness of Sukkah should carry us throughout the entire year. L'chaim. Sukkot is the holiday of happiness. Sukkot, interestingly, comes just two days after the 13th day of Tishrei, which observes the Hilula and the yard site of the Rebbe Maharash, the Rebbe Rav Shmuel, who said, the that from the very outset, we should go over all the obstacles, unlike what the rest of the world says, as Mekanish Tarunta Gateman Aribir, if you can't go under, only then do you go over. On Ichzog, as Lachatchila Aribir, the Rebbe Marash said, and I say from the very outset and the very beginning, set yourself in a mindset of going over all the issues before you even start. Don't allow them to bog you down. So, what is the secret of Jewish survival and the happiness of Sukkis? The happiness of Sukkis is very much linked to a verse, to a Pasuk, which Shleima Melech King Solomon states, God says, my left hand, he embraces the head of the Jewish people, Tachas L'Reshi. However, God's right hand, Techapkeni, will embrace me, meaning that God expresses his love with the right hand. And the Gemara says, and the Medrash brings it, this refers to the left hand corresponds to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Days of judgment, where God has a relationship with the Jewish people, but we're being judged. But right afterwards, without even any break, we go straight into the holiday of Sukkot. And then God says, that is the concept of Yemina, my right hand, Techapkeni, will embrace me. The Jewish people are loved and embraced by God. What is this secret? There are four primary things that we see in the holiday of Sukkot. First and foremost, like the name indicates, we build a Sukkah. The Sukkah, according to Jewish law, is to commemorate the fact that when the Jewish people traveled some 3,300 years ago in the desert of Sinai, God protected the Jews from four sides with the clouds of glory. In the winter, in the summer, they had built-in air conditioning, built-in heating, so to speak. It cleared up the roads. There were no snakes, there were no animals that attacked them. This was all as the result of the protection of the sukkah. But that's on a historic level. The question is, that happened 3,300 years ago. You want us, 3,300 years later, to celebrate with great joy because that's what happened so many years ago? The teachings of Hasidus bring the holiday to life. As we are always taught, that Hasidus doesn't dare introduce something new to Yiddishkeit, to Judaism. It reveals the beauty and the joy that was always there, but perhaps without Hasidus we wouldn't notice it. Hasidus explains there's far more to the relevance of the sukkah than just the commemoration of 3,300 years ago and the protection of the clouds of glory. There's actually a very current message, a contemporary message, a relevant message that applies to every single one of us. And as they say in America, everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants the message of sukkahs. Sukkot is first and foremost the sukkah. The sukkah, according to Jewish law, requires three walls at a minimum. But indeed, it doesn't really require three full walls. If you have two and a section, that's sufficient for a minimal kosher sukkah. So if you have two and a quarter walls, you're fine, you have a kosher sukkah. Obviously, you need tzach and covering and so on, but as far as the walls are concerned, it's sufficient. The Arizal, the famous Kabbalist of Tzfas, 
explains why is this. Because when you love somebody, how do you really ultimately express your unconditional love? It's when you give the person a hug and an embrace. The hug and the embrace envelops the person in their totality. We're not hugging their face. We're not hugging the child's cute cheeks. We're hugging the entirety of the child. We're hugging the entirety of our friend, of our loved one. Why is that? Because what we're looking to express is that it's not a particular feature or an aspect of their personality that you're loving. You're loving the person in totality. It's total acceptance. Who they are as they are. And therefore, the Arizal explains, how do we give a hug? We need the three sections of the hand. The upper section, the middle section, and the final section, which is much smaller than the upper two. So we need two plus sections in order to make the hug. If that's the case, the Arizal says, that's why Jewish law says, if you want to kosher sukkah, make sure you build at least two and plus walls so God can give you a physical hug. So the first mitzvah that we learn from sukkahs is, if we want happiness, we need to be able to embrace Am Yisrael, the Jewish people at large, and our friends and loved ones, not in increments, not by saying I love a certain aspect about you, but a true and, un and, and unconditional love, which is symbolic of a hug. That is the first thing that we see, and that is the reason why Hasidus explains based on that, the Gemara says that all of the Jewish people are worthy of going into the same sukkah. To sit in the same sukkah. Because when God is expressing that level of love, and that level of love comes because every Jew at his essence and at her essence has a God-given soul, a spark of Hashem, the divine spark, the neshama. And when you're talking about the neshama, and that is revealed in the sukkah, then indeed we truly have the entire Jewish people in one sukkah. Which brings us to the second point of the holiday of Sukkot, which is Achdus, Jewish unity. As we know, the four kinds of the Lulav and the Hadassim and the Esregim and the Aravis, the four different fruits, so to speak, that we use for the Bracha, the Lulav being from a palm tree, which represents tasty fruits, the Hadassim represent something that has a good aroma, it smells good, the Arava, the willow, represents something that doesn't have any taste and any smell. And the esrig, of course, represents those that have a good taste and a good smell, because that's what the esrig has. And taste and smell, in Hasidic thought, is the concept of taste, meaning the taste of Torah, knowledge, and the smell, the aroma, is the aroma of good deeds, masim tevim. And when we bring together Am Yisrael with all of these four, then and only then do we have true happiness Zman Sim Chaseinu, the holiday of true joy and celebration because we're united as one and nobody is being left out, no Jew will be left out of the picture of the sukkah. So those are two aspects of the holiday of sukkahs. We also have the holiday of sukkahs where we take the Lul of Anesetic and we make a blessing and a bracha on it. But when we're finished, Jewish custom is, in Yiddish we say, give it a shakl, give it a shake. But when you finish shaking it, there's something called na'anuyim. You move the lulav and the esrig in all the directions, east, west, north, south, up and down. And when you're done each time, you bring it to your heart. In other words, it's not sufficient to just sit in the sukkah and give a speech and say, I love all the Jewish people. The question really is, did you bring it down and internalize it into your heart? Is that really what you feel? When you bring it down into your heart, and it's not just an abstract faith, but it's actually Hasidic practice to actually love every Yid, because every Jew really has a neshama, and we're sitting in the sukkah together, united as one, and we're shaking the lulav and eslig in unity, and we're embracing and we're hugging, so to speak, and we even make sure that it comes down to the world of our heart, to the world of emotions, on my personal level, in my personal heart, and in your personal heart, then we have a true happy holiday. But we have one more aspect, which is very famous of the holiday of sukkahs, and that is the hishainus. Every day, for seven days of the holiday, we go around the bima in the shul and we recite a portion of the prayers based on the alphabet, of the olive base, and we thank God for all the wonderful things of God and the Jewish people. We highlight the virtues of the Jewish people. These days are called Simchas Beis HaShoyeva. 
the days when we actually used to pour water instead of wine on the Mizbeach, on the altar, in the times of the Temple. But what is these circling the table, the bima, and pouring water have to do with happiness? Hasidus explains, what's a circle? A circle is, there is no beginning and there is no end. It's a circle. The Jewish people, first of all, celebrate as a circle. We don't elevate any Jew to a point where everybody else is left out. We don't push anybody down where, to the point where that person no longer can participate. It's one circle, it's one people, it's one nation, and it's one family. So when we celebrate as a shyness and we go around in a circle, and everybody is equal, and we're truly equal, not because it's an ideology, because we believe that every Jew has a neshama, and every, every Jew comes from the same God. So we're all brothers and sisters, and as brothers and sisters, we're the same children to the same father. And that's the case, as the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya chapter 32, we are all truly equal because we all possess a part of Hashem, our loving Father in heaven. Secondly, we pour the water, not the wine. What is the water symbolic of? Wine has taste. Water, as we know, primarily is tasteless. In fact, the Talmud has a discussion if we should even make a blessing over water because it doesn't seem to have a real taste. When you drink wine, at least you taste something. With water, it's kind of tasteless. Although at the end, obviously, we do make a blessing. But from a taste point of view, water is simple. It's pure. Wine is symbolic, according to Hasidus, of logic, of reason. It makes sense. It tastes good. The word for taste in Hebrew is tam. Interestingly, the word tam means reason. Tam also means taste. So something that's logical has a good taste, and therefore it's kind of reasonable to do so. So when we look at our fellow Jew, when we find a Jew that's well-behaved and gives charity and lives well amongst his neighbors and her neighbors, then of course such a Jew should be loved. But am I obligated to accept and embrace and hug even my brothers who don't necessarily always behave the way I believe they should according to the Torah? Comes along the water of the Simchas Beis HaShieva, which we pour on the Mizbeach, on the altar, and teaches us, pour water, don't pour just wine. Because wine tells me you're committed to good tasting things. You have good taste, that's wonderful. But what happens when it's not according to your taste? Do you reject it? The water teaches us, every Jew, even the Jew that seems to be tasteless, even a love that has no reason, no logical reason why to do this, it's not a tasty love. It's not a love that's logical. It's the unconditional love of God to the Jewish people, of the Jewish people to God, and from the Jewish people to each other as the children of God. So when we have all of these ingredients in the mix of the holiday of Sukkot, then of course we start celebrating the holiday at a much higher level and a much more joyful and, 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 and joyous level. As a matter of fact, the Talmud teaches us, One who never witnessed the joy and the celebration that took place in the times of the Temple in Jerusalem and Yerushalayim when they would celebrate the days of Simchas Beis HaShayeva, the water, during the holiday of Sukkot, for those stretch of days, never saw true happiness in his life. When you're a child and you read that Gemara, you say, must have been a very happy party. They were really, really dancing. What do you mean? Did nobody ever saw such another party in their life? Chassidus explains, because if you don't celebrate that way, in other words, you're not celebrating water, you're celebrating wine, you're celebrating logic and reason, then by definition it's impossible for you to have a true happiness. Because your happiness is limited to the strength and the power of the logic. As strong as the logic is, that's how strong your happiness is. But when you're celebrating not wine, you're celebrating water, which is simple and pure, tasteless so to speak, but it's precisely its purity. There's nothing as pure as water. The human being is created in water. Our body is primarily made up of water. The world is mostly water. Mayim is the purity of our existence. And when we tune into purity, it may not have logic, but logic is not the strongest level of our existence. Every child knows that the greatest love that they can receive from their parent is not a logical compliment. Not to say to the child, the reason why I love you is because you're so cute and you're so much fun and you get such good grades when you go to school. That's an insult. That's why you love your child. As if to say to the child, and if one day you're not so cute and you don't receive good grades, I'm going to reject you. The parent says to the child, I love you unconditionally, no matter what happens. Of course we want the nachas. 
But to say that that's the logical reason, no. The parent is committed to the child unconditionally, and that's the love of God to the Jewish people when it comes to the holiday of Sukkot. And now we understand why the holiday of Sukkot is primarily done right after Yom Kippur. The obvious question would be, the Gemara says, but why is the reason that we call the second month on the Jewish calendar Cheshvan, and we add a word Mar Cheshvan, if you're writing a Jewish document that requires a date, you put the words Mar Cheshvan, the bitter month of Cheshvan. So it is explained because Cheshvan has no holidays. After coming out a month of Tishrei, starting from Rosh Hashanah, and Shabbat Shuvah, and Yom Kippur, and Yid Gimel Tishrei, L'chad Chila Ribbon, and Sukkis, and you go into Chalamayid, and Shaina Rabbah, and Shmini Atzeres, and Simchas Taira, and the dancing, it's a loaded month. Of course you're celebrating. So why would you do that if you're complaining the next month is bitter, all you need to do is shuffle some of the holidays over a few days and bring the holiday of Sukkot, which stretches nine days a little bit into the, into the month of Cheshvan, and you won't have to call it bitter anymore. Chassidus explains, God says, I don't have time to wait. The reason why we're going to have the holiday immediately is because if the Jew walks away from Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur experience thinking and feeling, you know something? God really judges me. Once a year, he takes out the books and he starts kind of picking little details there. Did I do this? Did I do that? Was I perfect here? Perfect that? And for every deed, God writes down exactly what it is. Kind of, sounds kind of judgmental. Comes along God and he says, tell my child, tell the Jewish people. I love them dearly. It's two separate things. I want to make them clean. So I'm going to go through the details so I can clean up, so to speak, their past mistakes. But at the core, God says, it's true. He gives you support for your head with his left hand. But Viyimina, his right hand, Techapkeni hugs you and embraces you. God says, make sure that holiday of Sukkot comes immediately after Yom Kippur. Because I don't want the Jew walking away with the feeling, thinking that he or she were rejected by God because of their mistakes. To the contrary, it is unconditional love where God embraces us 100%. And that is the reason why we celebrate the holiday of our happiness, which carries over for the entirety of the year. Just like Rosh Hashanah is a blessing for life for the entire year, if you want to be happy through the course of the year, celebrate the holiday of Sukkot, because that is when God gives out this blessing for the entirety of the upcoming year. The Rebbe's father, Rebbe Lev Yitzhak Shneerson, who passed away in Kazakhstan and suffered five years under horrible conditions as a result of leading the Jewish people at that time in the former Soviet Union, the Rebbe's father has an amazing piece on Sukkot, a lengthy piece, but just to highlight one little line of it, the Rebbe's father speaks about the word Sukkah. The word Sukkah is spelled in Hebrew Samach, Vav, Kaf, He. If you take the two outer words, meaning the first letter and the final letter of the word Sukkah, that's the Samach and the He, numerically that equals 65. If you take the two middle letters, you'll have a Vav and a Chaf, that's a 6 and a 20, together it's 26. 65 corresponds to the, to the shame Adonai, to the name of God, which we say when we make a blessing, which has its origins in the word Adnus, God controls and owns and dictates the world. He's an Adon, a master. But then there is the two middle letters, 26, the Vav and the Chaf. That corresponds to the God's name, which transcends the limitations of this finite world. It is the infinity of God beyond, beyond the finite minutia of this physical world. world. Sometimes we look at this world and we believe, look what's going on. What's going on with this world? It seems to be out of control. God comes along and says, I just want you to know something. The world that seems to be so programmed and so particular in the way it maneuvers, because it's fixed to the shame Adnai, really has its roots in the transcendent God that's unlimited and can make any situation, including a pandemic, turn it into a miracle. And therefore, if that's the case... God says to us, go into the sukkah. Because I want you to see that even the difficulties in life, which come from the outer two letters of the word sukkah, which correspond to the shame of, shame of Hashem, the name of God, Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud, are really connected to the middle two letters, to the Chavav, to the 26. And therefore, if we do that and we celebrate the sukkah correctly, we can infuse even the challenges of our life with the infinity of God transforming tragedy into triumph into a celebration.
it is absolutely amazing to see how the Rebbe's father, with a few words, takes such a simple word of the word sukkah, which everybody has heard of, and transforms it in such a powerful message. Taking it one step further, the Rebbe's father writes in another place, in Lekutei Levi Yitzchak, and he quotes the prophet who teaches us that a sukkah is compared to a sukkah mimachsayim, mimachsayim, mizerim, or mimater. The sukkah is compared to a shield from the currents and from the rain. Zerim is a current, matar is rain. Says the Rebbe's father, Rebbe Levi Yitzchak Schneerson, what's the connection between the sukkah and shielding you from current, from rain? The Rebbe's father says, what keeps us as Jews? And remember, the Rebbe's father fought for Mesira Snefesh, self-sacrifice, and he gave his life to make sure that every Jew can have his and her Yiddishkeit, even in the darkest days of communism in the former Soviet Union. What keeps us is our faith. Our faith is based on 248 commandments, Ramach, Mitzvah, I say, the 248 commandments that God give, gave us for each of us to do. Says the Rebbe's father, the word Zerem equals 247. The word Matar, Reish Mem Tes, equals 249. God only gave us 248, which corresponds to the 248 parts of the body, Ramach Ivarim. And therefore, says the Rebbe's father, if you want to be shielded and you want to be secure and safe, make sure we don't play around with God's commandments. Don't make it extra and don't make it less. Just follow instructions. And God says, I guarantee you, when you follow the instructions according to the recipe that I gave you, you will have a happy, shielded life from all the issues and all the blessings that we all need. So therefore, the, the, the holiday of Sukkot, according to the Rebbe's father's explanation, is very closely tied to Emuna, which is the overarching, general, enveloping. When you walk into the sukkah, you're enveloped by the sukkah. The Emuna is enveloping the human being and the Jew, particularly in the holiday of Sukkot, in all of our entirety, in all of our existence. A number of years ago, when I was in Almaty, I had in Kazakhstan, in the country and the city, unfortunately, where the Rebbe's father passed away, and where his holy resting place is. I had the good fortune to meet a particular Jew whose name was Rabbi Yaina. Rabbi Yaina was a very special Jew. He was in his 90s. And the following happened with him. Rabbi Yaina lived in, the, in white Russia. And when the Nazis came during World War II, he was a young teenager and he was fighting for his life. So he escaped all the way to the country of Kazakhstan, which is sandwiched between Russia and China, all the way in the Far East, so to speak. When he got there, he was afraid that the Nazis would pursue him and find him somewhere. So he deliberately went and he sought out a little village where there wasn't another Jew in sight. And he blended in to a completely non-Jewish environment, a Kazakhi environment, hoping and praying that the Nazis would never trace him down there. Well, it's true, the Nazis never found him. But unfortunately, as the years went on, he became stuck in this non-Jewish environment. Here he is, Rabbi Yaina, as a Jew, stuck by himself. Sixty years have passed. And the Rebbe sent out a shliach to the country of Kazakhstan, Rabbi Shaya Cohen, who together with his brothers built up a beautiful Chabad house and seven other Chabad centers around the country of Kazakhstan. Somebody told Rabbi Yaina, you know that in the city of Almata, there is a shul, there's a synagogue function. There's a synagogue, as they say in Russian. He said, it's impossible. Synagogue? He says, when I was a child, I went to Jewish school, I went to Chayd, and I know you need at least 10 people, 10 men over Bar Mitzvah to make a minion. There are no 10 living Jews after Hitler in this part of the world. But they convinced him, they said, no, no, you got to go check it out. There's really a functioning shul. He took the bus, and he arrived to the city of Almata, and he finally made his way with his cane. I remember his stick that he used to walk, and his cowboy hat, and he arrived to the Chabad house. When he walked into the Chabad house, it happened to be Chalamayit Sukkot, the middle days of the holiday of Sukkot. And he asked, does anybody know where the rabbi is? The shul was empty. Somebody said to him, the rabbi is inside in the sukkah. He came into the sukkah, and he met Rabbi Shaya Cohen's brother, Rabbi Elchanan Cohen. And Rabbi Elchanan says to him, you're obviously Jewish. You speak any Yiddish. He looked like an Ashkenazic Jew. He didn't look like a Sephardic Jew from the eastern parts of, of, of the region. And he said, yes, and I even speak a little bit of Yiddish. He said, in Yiddish, it's already 60 years I haven't spoken the language of Yiddish. And Rabbi Elchanan offered him 
would you like to shake the lulav and esrig, make a bracha? He said, of course, I remember the lulav and esrig. Would you like me to help you to say the bracha? He says, no, he makes it with his hand. You know, it's okay, I can handle this on my own. He takes the lulav and esrig, Rabbi Yena, and he puts it together, and he makes a beautiful bracha, a blessing. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech ha'olam hamotzi lecha min ha'aretz. Rabbi Elchanan Cohen says to him, what's this? Hamotzi? That's made for bread. He says, listen to me. I'm already 60 years lost as an isolated Jew in a small town and village because of the Nazis. I lost my family, and this is where I am. 60 years ago, he left his parents, and he ran on his own to survive, and he survived. He says, but never in 60 years that I miss even one morning of davening and praying to Hashem. I wake up every single morning, and I daven and I pray. And I say, Almighty God, Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech Ha'elam Hamaitzi Lecha Min Ha'aretz. That is pure emuna. That is faith. That is a Jew who knew that no matter what, but the power of the sukkah, ironically brought him back. That was the day that he came back on a sukkah. And based on Rebbe Levik's, and the Rebbe's father's teachings, Rebbe Levi Yitzchak's teachings, that the sukkah shows us the strength and the emuna and the faith of the Jew, Rabbi Yenna came back on the holiday of sukkah. Remained later in the Chabadas for many holidays. I saw them there a number of times when I was there later on. He would come to the Chabadas quite often with his cowboy hat and his cane, and then would have his l'chaim or two, and then he would say, I got to go, I got to take the bus back home. May his soul rest in peace. But the beauty of the message is an obvious one. The holiday of Sukkot is a holiday of love, of embracing of realizing that even if there are reasons of disagreement, but it's Sukkot. Sukkot, all Jews get along. Sukkot, we hug everybody. Sukkot, we bring all the Jews together, all the four kinds, even the one that's tasteless, even the one that does nothing good and has no Torah knowledge. But we are one nation under one God as one people. So L'chaim, may we able to celebrate this holiday of Sukkot with happy hearts. May God bless us that this holiday of happiness should break down all the barriers. Simcha Peretz Gedder. I'm not sure if ever in history was there a world lockdown like this on the holiday of Sukkot. But Jews have an answer for every situation, when, even when it's painful. Because survival is our key, and we know that the Jew and God and Torah are always eternal, and therefore is something we're going to survive, and we're going to thrive from. L'chaim to Simcha, to pure happiness, unconditional happiness. And ultimately... May our happiness of this holiday of Sukkot penetrate and break down all the barriers and may we merit to see a world of peace, of health, and in harmony with the coming of We Want Mashiach Now. Thank you very much for joining L'chaim.